So we are ready to start with our first panel, which is a top-down macro outlook from global to Ukrainian trends. So we would like to have a look how the global trends are affecting Ukrainian economy that is getting more integrated in, into the global one. Uh, what challenges Ukraine may face in the nearest future and what actions may be taken in order to overcome those kind of challenges. Uh, but before we start with the panel, uh, we would like to have uh, the voting. We believe that uh, we have a very high level audience uh, today. That's why we would like to ask you to cast your votes uh, on a question. So can I ask please to start the voting? Okay. Before, oh, okay, so before I will, I will ask you to cast your votes, I would like to tell you a short manual how to use uh, the kind of devices that you have on your chairs. So in order to cast a vote, you should turn on your device with the on button. Then you press the letter that represents uh, the motion that you would like to vote for, and then you push the OK button. So please uh, keep in mind this kind of script that you will be uh, using. And um, we are ready basically to start the voting. So the question is, which one of the unrealized reforms will have the greatest impact on the long-term economic growth of Ukraine? And let's start. Okay, so it looks like, you know, uh, the almost all reforms are of the same kind of importance, but of, of course the, the, the land reform and the privatization is like the uh, paramount importance for Ukraine. Uh, we will also ask you to vote the same question after the panel because we are interested whether you will change your mind um, after the speech and discussion that we will have during the panel. So now I would like to introduce a person who will be the moderator of the first panel. You know this person very well. This is a former Minister of Economy. Uh, now he is a strategist in the ProRiv in UA. And uh, we very well know him from his work uh, in the government, for his strife in reforms, and for his educational projects uh, and the knowledge that he has uh, contributed to his students and to the general public. So please uh, welcome Paolo Sheremieta. Thank you, Alexander. It's a nice, very nice introduction. So where is the screen? Uh, I guess we have, I don't know why, why do we have to vote again? Probably we have to prove that reform's already done, you know, so we have the zero to bring it up, no? <laughs> anyway, guys, it's Friday morning, life is good, despite the rain, uh, it's much warmer than it used to be three days ago, or four days ago, it was snowing here. Uh, not in Kiev though, but I was in Vinnytsia, so and my car was full of snow, and I still have the summer uh, tires, so I was quite, quite, uh, quite, how should I say, risk, risk prone. Okay. Well, anyway, um, let me let me introduce the panel first of all. We have a great panel to kind of unlock the issues that are going on uh, in the global economy and the Ukrainian economy. Uh, we have Dmitro Solohub, uh, Deputy Governor of National Bank of Ukraine. Please, please come here. Uh, we have uh, Gosta Lungman, uh, resident representative uh, in Ukraine from IMF. 
Farouk Khan, lead economist, uh, program leader for Ukraine, Belarus, and Moldova from the World Bank. And Neil Withers, uh, the president of CFA Association Russia. Uh, oh, of course, yeah, somehow, how do I miss it? Makar Pasenyuk, of course, you know. <laughs> uh, managing partner, the head of investment committee, Absolutely. ICU. You know, he's always, he's always so discreet, you know. It's basically, you wouldn't believe that's the first time I see him uh, in life. You know, of course, uh, I heard, heard a lot about him, but we finally met. So, Makar, <laughs> good to see you. Well, anyway, um, look, um, I, have a, I have a script, but, uh, but, I, but uh, we, have a, we have an elephant in the room. Uh, should we start with this? Because, uh, because we have to start with the geopolitics anyway, somehow. Uh, Jerome Powell, as the candidate for the, uh, for the uh, Fed chair uh, as of uh, yesterday night, uh, anyone wants to jump in uh, as the icebreaker and uh, give a comment? I don't expect a comment from IMF, of course. <laughs> How about you, Neil? Uh, can, I, can I ask you, you know, what's, what's your opinion? I know that he's, he's an investment banker and does not have a degree in economics, and it's the first candidate for the, that position in 40 years who does not have a uh, degree in economics. Big hello to my friends in all of the economic schools in the world in Kiev, too. Uh, Dmitro, you're the graduate of one. <laughs> anyway, Neil, what's your, what's, what's your take on that? Um, I think, the, um, I think the, the biggest difficulty is, in fact, uh, in creating a, a government which will work. Um, and uh, we see around the world, I mean, even, even in Canada where I'm from, the, the answers have not yet been, all been discovered. Um, and so it needs, uh, it needs people at the top who actually are trying to do the best for the society. I mean, in, in a parallel, in effect, to the CFA, we, we don't exist as a professional association to make money for ourselves. We exist to, to make money for ourselves and help society. Um, so I don't particularly have a, a question on this, but I think in the, uh, in the macro view of, uh, of Ukraine and its future development, uh, the connection to the rest of the world is, is very important, and that involves uh, effective negotiations and, and conversations across borders. Thank you, Neil. Uh, uh, let, me, let me ask that question. I mean, you, you, you gave a good uh, opening. Uh, uh, President Trump picked the candidate for the Fed yesterday. His name is Jerome Powell. Uh, what do we expect for Ukraine, in your opinion, and maybe for the, for this, uh, for the region? Uh, does it have an influence? I mean, is the guy the hawk or a dove? I mean, what, what do we expect of him? Uh, I think as, as leader of the Fed, he's a, a good, conservative, safe set of hands. Uh, he's worked there before um, for a long time. I don't expect to see major changes. So the impact on Ukraine is not going to come from this new person. The impact on Ukraine is going to come from the changes uh, in the general economic level of the world and particularly of, of interest rates. I think uh, we've had huge amounts of creation of money in the United States, in the EU, in Japan, uh, and my traditional economic background was you create money and if, uh, if the economy doesn't expand to use it all up, it ends up in higher prices. Uh, I think that's a hidden uh, threat to uh, particularly uh, countries on the edge of the developed world. Um, I'm not sure emerging is the right term to use any longer. Uh, but uh, our economic system has been used to a global sense of of easy money and low interest rates, and I think that will change. I think we'll see significant changes, and they could happen quite quickly. Um, it's not necessarily going to be uh, the same very gradual quarter percent uh, that we've just seen in, in the UK, and uh, uh, you could see interest rates. Um, a friend of mine had to renew his mortgage in Canada. We have five-year terms to mortgages. He had to renew his mortgage because the five years were up at 21%. That is going to be a very difficult environment for 
many countries. Makar, can we have your opinion from Kiev on that? Uh, you work on, I'm sure you work on further capital raising and IPOs. Uh, do you expect the uh, interest rate environment in the world uh, to be favorable, unfavorable? What's your, in light of yesterday's uh, announcement? Uh, well, I think uh, uh, it remains to be seen uh, uh, what the policy would be going forward. I think, uh, at least in, in our opinion, it's, it's, uh, it's clear that uh, low growth uh, um, is, uh, is, um, is a problem, uh, but at the same time, if you see it, uh, if you look at what is happening uh, with inflation trends, I think, uh, you know, um, a lot of people uh, underestimate that, and um, uh, it's quite possible that uh, uh, the rates would be uh, raising in, uh, rising in 2018. Uh, obviously, uh, and the rate you're mentioning is the U.S. rate. Yeah, right? yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm talking about the states, yeah, because you know this is what in the end of the day uh, drives the curve. So, um, uh, for Ukraine, uh, which is uh, trading uh, very widely to uh, uh, you know historical uh, levels uh, to uh, benchmarks, uh, I think. Uh, you know, there are two trends that will influence the cost of borrowing. One is, uh, you know, the, the uh, increase of the best or, or the possible increase of the uh, uh, base rate in the states. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, contraction of the uh, risk premium uh, for Ukraine itself. Okay. Thank you, Makar. And thank you, by the way, th thank you for being brief. Uh, let's have, you know, as lively discussion as we can, and then we go and get the questions from the audience. Uh, now, let me include uh, now uh, you, Mr. Lungman, and you, uh, Mr. Han. Uh, what are the other elephants uh, in the global arena that we have to discuss, at least mention, before we move to, you know, to Ukraine, to our country, and, and, and discuss the issues here? Costa? I think for, for, for Ukraine, uh, um, um, the, if the issue is how to um, generate growth in, in Ukraine, uh, it is the, um, it, it's dependent on uh, the growth in, in uh, its export markets. So I think that, that's, the, uh, that's the issue. The, the other thing that I, I think is important is, to, uh, is the potential access to European markets through the GCFTA. And, uh, but that, that there, a lot depends on Ukraine and Ukraine's um, progress in, in um, implementing the, the vast number of reforms that are necessary to integrate uh, product markets with the European markets. Faru? Um, you know, um, for, a while, for historically, uh, the, the industrialized world, um, the richest countries in the world the champ were the champions of international integration. Uh, right now, the greatest threat to globalization and international integration comes from the, uh, the industrialized world. And the election of Donald Trump, which very few people um, uh, expected, is a manifestation of that. Um, and, and the reason for this is that for the last three decades, um, the lower skilled workers in the industrialized world have basically experienced stagnant or declining real wages. Um, and this has, this has basically boiled over and resulted in many of the dramatic political changes that we have witnessed um, in, in the industrialized world. Uh, Brexit, uh, I mentioned the election in the United States, and we see other elections um, in Western Europe um, that pose um, a potential threat um, to, uh, to a global integration. So I think how that plays out will have a, a major impact uh, on the future of Ukraine, on the future of emerging markets and their prospects uh, generally to catch up um, uh, with the rest of the world. Uh, and in such an environment, it is, uh, it is important to have um, a, a, you know, reasonable people in, um, uh, in positions of responsibility. Um, and, and that is why I think um, the appointment of, um, uh, of Jerome Powell uh, to uh, head the Federal Reserve is a good sign. He, he should provide some continuity. Um, uh, and he's one of the more reasonable uh, appointments that we have seen uh, from the U.S. administration. 
So it's, uh, it's another, uh, this, uh, how do they call them, this, the, the old guard, the, the adults, the adults in the room, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you for that. Uh, maybe my last, uh, last um, uh, question on, this, uh, on the global area. You, uh, Mr. Lungman, you mentioned the, the DCFTA. Um, uh, how strong is Europe and European Union at the moment in light of Brexit, in light of Catalonia, but also in light of Merkel's uh, re-election and Macron uh, election? Mr. Lugman. I want to be careful to comment on political developments because it really isn't, isn't my area. Can, can, uh, can you comment as a Swede, you know, not, 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 not as IMF representative? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think what, what we see, what, what is encouraging is that we see uh, growth and broad-based growth in, in not only in the world economy but particularly in, in Europe and I think that is um, that's, it's positive for Europe but it's also positive for, for Ukraine. <laughs> you are careful. Okay. I knew that. <laughs> well, let's get to the Ukrainian issues then. Since we do not want to comment on the, on the European politics, I wonder how would you comment on the Ukrainian one. But uh, Dmitro, I didn't give you the floor yet. Um, uh, you know, please try to connect uh, what we have just discussed in the world uh, to this small but open economy which Ukraine is. Well. Having the privilege of speaking last in this round, I should say that I agree with everything which has been said already. Yes. <laughs> um, and also regarding a new candidate for the Fed governor, uh, I would say that unfortunately I don't know him personally, in contrast to the another guy who is a front runner and a short list contender, Mr. John Taylor. Many of you probably have been present when he gave an excellent speech on BU research conference here in Kiev and I may this year. But in general, I would say, um, I, at least what, from what I have seen, I expect basically continuity in US uh, monetary policy, which is, I think, very important for the central banks, I mean, including, including ours. Uh, but in general, regarding global developments and the impact of Ukraine, I think, I mean, the factors which have been discussed, and I think one was not mentioned, but probably one of the most relevant is the global commodity prices. And uh, all these factors, to some extent, now are very much relevant to Ukraine. Commodity prices to the greater extent, because unfortunately, even with some diversification we have seen in the last four years, uh, the country is still very much dependent on the global commodity trends. We have seen it last year to the negative side when uh, iron ore and steel prices slided at the beginning of the year and that had impact on domestic indicators. This year we have a other way around when economy is improving, boosted by uh, terms of trade. Yes, also by other developments, prudent policies, but terms of trade are playing an important role. Regarding uh, global financial conditions, interest rates and so on, well, for two years or for three years, Ukraine has been pretty insulated from development of global financial markets, but not for good, yeah? because the country was in deep crisis. There were no foreign capital here, and there was no access to the global financial markets and so on. But it changed now with the tapping the market in, uh, in September. And we also see now more uh, interest from uh, foreign investors coming to the local debt market. So it means that indeed the changes in the global financial conditions going forward will have an impact on Ukraine, on the refinancing profile and so on. And here what's important to keep in mind that Ukraine, yes, it would be affected if there is a monetary tightening around the world as all other emerging markets, but the potential for yields compression, for spreads compression is enormous in Ukraine, yeah? given, given the current rating outlook and so on. And uh, again, what should be done, everybody knows. Yeah? Continue IMF program, make all the structural reforms and so on and so on. So in this respect, I would say I'm moderately positive, yeah? Con conditionally moderately positive. Yeah? If this is done, if these conditions are uh, fulfilled, then I actually see uh, pretty smooth, I would say, refinancing outlook for Ukraine um, at the global market. Okay, thank you, Dmitro. Uh, can, you, can you comment on uh, what we had, on the vote that we had? Uh, maybe yes. expressing your... I voted F. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because I believe that all these reforms are actually very important, but the one reform is missing which is basically a prerequisite for all of that. It's a public administration reform. And that's actually what uh, I would judge from the Why don't you experience. tell me? Why don't you tell me this F option? You know, I would, I would, I would vote the same. You know? <laughs> uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's ask the, the rest of the panel. Uh, 
back to the to the vote that we had. Uh, what's your what's your opinion? Uh, maybe you would add the G, uh, I, I, and H. You know, whatever uh, the, the letters in the alphabet are. Um, Farouk. Yeah, well, you know, I, it's difficult to argue that any one of these reforms are unimportant. And I would agree with uh, uh, Dima that uh, public administration reform, judicial reform are also tremendously important for Ukraine. Um, but if I were to focus on one, I think I would um, pick land reform because, uh, you know, every reform has a time and a place. Um, and I think the public sentiment on the importance of land reform in Ukraine um, has shifted considerably in the last one year. And at least the attention of the government uh, to this critical reform area has, uh, has, has uh, you know, increased tremendously in the uh, last one year. I, what I understand is that previously this was considered an untouchable area um, because it was, it was considered to be so politically sensitive. Um, but uh, over the last year, there have been, uh, you know, many discussions on, on the importance of land reform and the type of reform um, that, uh, that can take place to open up uh, a, or create a transparent market for land transactions in Ukraine. Um, so I think uh, the, the, the time and place for um, land reform uh, is uh, here and now uh, in Ukraine. And I would just point out some, uh, you know, a, a few numbers to uh, um, uh, illustrate how important this is. Uh, value added in agriculture in Ukraine is about $400 per hectare, uh, compared to about $1,100 in Poland, uh, $1,500 uh, in France, and close to $2,000 um, uh, in Germany. Um, compare that to the fact that Ukraine has the largest uh, stock of arable land in Europe, about 33 million hectares of arable land. The next country um, is France with about 17 million. So Ukraine really, really should be a global standout in agriculture. Uh, the problem is it's the standout in the wrong direction. Value added in agriculture is one of the lowest in Europe. And this, this lack of land markets in Ukraine is a major bottleneck. Thank, this, thank you. For, thank okay. you. Yeah. Makar, can I get, can I get your, your opinion? I think nobody can be happy with this uh, two, you know, two to three percent growth that we have. Uh, a part of me who witnessed minus 15 in uh, f 14 and 15 <laughs> being in the government. Uh, but of course, we dream about 7 and 8 percent of kind of the breakthrough. Uh, in, you know, in connection to the vote that we had, uh, what, what is your opinion on that? Well, I, uh, I voted uh, Lent as well. Lent as well. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll explain why. I think uh, Farouk uh, made a very uh, good comment. It's all about time and place. And uh, if we're talking, if we kind of assume that we live now and uh, we're talking short-term changes, uh, I think uh, land reform has the biggest uh, potential in terms of impact. Uh, uh, apart from, you know, Ukraine being a force in the global agri-sector, you know, to put things into perspective, um, just the state owns roughly 12 million hectares uh, of land. If you assume that uh, you know, if you uh, assume that uh, on average uh, the uh, uh, annual rent uh, for land is uh, 150 dollars, then using a very conservative cap rate of 10 percent, you arrive uh, at the implied value of uh, uh, 1,500 per hectare. You multiply it by uh, 10 million hectares, uh, for simplicity's sake, because I'm, you know, I'm getting old to do the numbers in my head. Uh, you get to 15 billion, which is a very relevant number. And uh, in the end of the day, it's all about relevance. Uh, and uh, I personally believe that, uh, and we're just talking about state land, right? So the money goes to the state coffers. You know, uh, uh, the. Um, uh, uh, the currency reserves get replenished, uh, uh, then uh, you know, it gets all the good things such as the uh, GDP multiple and uh, you know, so on and so forth, uh, all, uh, you know, everything that uh, we, uh, we can talk about you know, endlessly. But uh, uh, I think the key is, uh, is relevance uh, and uh, the ability to do a short-term uh, you know, massive impact. And uh, I think this is land. Uh, because if, if you talk about, you know, privatization in general, you know, uh, governance, all, all those things are important. But uh, my personal view is that uh, for all the uh, state enterprises, which uh, Ukraine is 
realistically uh, is in a position to, pri uh, to privatize, to sell. You know, the numbers are, are, are incomparable. Okay, thank you, Makar. Neil, how about your view? Um, I, I think there's a bias in the panel. Um, I also voted for land reform. Uh, not that I know very much about the situation in Ukraine, and I've learned some of the numbers just now. Um, but coming from Canada, and incidentally from Russia, land is big. Um, but Ukraine has a much richer land. It should be producing so much more. I think, I think food is the, the oil of the next century. I think that uh, energy will become almost free and oil will become a bit surplus. Uh, but food is always going to it's, be necessary. It's interesting to hear that, the view from Russia. <laughs> and from Canada. Um, we're both export uh, and Canada, pet pet right, yeah, petrochemical so. exporters. Uh, but uh, I, I voted for land reform because it's in fact the one long-term thing. The others are short-term problems. Uh, if you get land into the hands of more people, there will be more people trying. And I believe the, the financial freedom that comes from ownership uh, will be very important for the development of, of society. That, uh, these are not problems that can be uh, solved from the top down. They have to be solved by individual initiatives, working with resources available to them. Um, and the diversity of land ownership would be a great surplus, a great, a great positive effect. Thank you, Neil. And now let's hear the correct answer coming from IMF from Washington, D.C. Kirsten. <laughs> I thought this was, a, <clears throat> this was a difficult choice, and I think all of these reforms are, are uh, clearly important. Uh, tax administration reform is important to uh, reduce corruption, to increase efficiency in, in tax administration, privatization and reduction of, of uh, the size of the public sector is also important. Put these companies in the hands of managers who have, have incentives to add value and create, create employment. I voted land reform uh, because I think that is the reform that uh, is, has clear and tangible short-term results. As Farouk mentioned, he, he put it very well that uh, the, even though Ukraine has vast agricultural potential, uh, the productivity is much lower than countries with, with uh, less arable lands. So uh, productivity per, per worker is about, a, uh, is about um, uh, a third of what it is in, in Europe, and, and output per, per hectare is about two-thirds of what it is in, in Europe. It should be, should be higher, and it's, it's, a, um, it, it's a concrete reform uh, to enable the, the um, market-based uh, purchase and sale of land that has the potential to generate uh, investment uh, and increase productivity in, in the land sector. So it's something that, that uh, should be done without delay. Well, look, uh, I mean, the first uh, the conclusion, intermediate conclusion that we can make is that we have a very unrepresentative for the rest of the room panel because 83% I voted for land reform too. <laughs> 83% voted for land reform. <laughs> Dmitro would vote for land reform if he would not work for the, you know, in the, in the government quarter for the last, what, two and a half years already. So he, he understands the, the, the importance of uh, something else, which is the public administration reform. But anyway, Gost, let, let me still, still tease you, okay? So you voted for land reform. 83% of the panel voted for land reform. 40% of the whole voted for uh, land reform, and IMF dropped land reform as uh, the criteria for the, for the uh, continuation of the next, uh, next tranche and continuation of IMF uh, cooperation with Ukraine, if I get it right. Uh, and please correct if I didn't, didn't get it right. I'm sorry, I have to correct you. Good. <laughs> So, uh, in the context of the IMF program, we have not dropped land reform. Land reform continues to be a key element of the program. Uh, what we have done is we recognize that the land reform has to be designed correctly, uh, and there are preconditions that have to be met. So, we agreed to uh, postpone the land reform as a criteria for 
the IMF review, so postpone it from 2017 to 2018. So it's only a matter of timing, and it's a matter of timing in recognition of the preparation and consensus building that uh, is necessary to do to ensure that this reform is done in the correct way. Because I understand the art of politics, of course, but uh, for how long are you in Ukraine? Uh, is it like three or four months? Is that more or less correct? Uh, yes, I'm here since June. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm here since uh, 1971. I know what in Ukraine postponement means, okay? So. <laughs> Anyway, uh, and that's, look, we still need to continue a little bit. Please expand, because that, that is an elephant in the Ukrainian room, the cooperation with IMF. So you postponed that, that uh, uh, action item, uh, uh, condition item. Uh, they, there are four others uh, that are still valid and active. Well, first of all, if you would list them, and second of all, if you would comment, uh, of course, the official opinion, your opinion, uh, on how Ukraine progresses on these uh, four items. Um, sure. So we are about two-thirds through uh, basically what is an, a five-year IMF program. Uh, so far, under the IMF program, we have dispersed about $12.5 billion. Um, and before going into sort of what was necessary for uh, the completion of the next review of the program, I'd just like to take one quick step back and, and point out that uh, how much that has been achieved already uh, over the past, uh, past three years. Um, and I mean, first of all, the, the addressing the issues in the banking sector, cleaning up the banking sector, closing uh, about 90 banks has been been really important for uh, for for the stability of the banking sector. Uh, the introduction. Could you excuse me, please, Dimitra, At this point, I would have a you know triumphant look uh, and you know look at the audience and you know I mean we have to recognize the heroes you know uh, who did this. No, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, and I was going to that. That's my. The heroes are normally shy, right? Yeah. No, that's that's my second point. Is the uh, the changes in monetary policy, so moving from a fixed to to uh, a floating exchange rate, and the introduction of of uh, inflation targeting as the the monetary anchor, uh, also a, a a big and important step. Uh, fiscal consolidation, cutting public expenditures uh, from about 54% of GDP to uh, about 40% of GDP and reducing the, the, um, uh, the, the fiscal deficit down to about 3% of GDP, also a, a, a big and important step forward. Uh, the fight against corruption, setting up NABU, introducing mand mandatory asset declarations for public officials is is. In, in the context of, of Ukraine, where uh, rampant corruption is, is uh, uh, probably the, the single biggest obstacle for, for investment and, and um, uh, economic development, is also crucial. And uh, the initiation of energy sector reforms and, and increasing domestic gas prices to import parity in 2016 is, is also something that I think is uh, important to, to recognize as uh, key achievement that uh, over the past three years. So uh, for us, um, or for, for uh, in the context of the IMF program, what's uh, now conditions for moving on uh, to the fourth review under the program is, um, first of all, is it, it's uh, the adoption of a uh, new privatization law and a privatization law that ensures that uh, uh, the sale of, of state assets are done in, in um, a transparent, open and, and market-based way. Uh, it is uh, the, the adoption of a pension reform which was done two weeks ago but uh, we are now in the process of uh, evaluating that reform and ensuring that it meets the criteria for, for a pension system that, that we uh, agreed with the government back, back in May. Uh, it's set the, the adoption of legislation setting up uh, an anti-corruption court uh, and it's uh, the adjustment of 
domestic gas prices in line with the automatic gas prices adjustment mechanism that was adopted in a government resolution back in February uh, this year. Okay. Thank you, Gustav. I'm sure there will be questions. By the way, get ready with your questions. I will ask maybe two more and then I will get back to the hall and you'll be asking for the rest almost one hour. Uh, Dmitro, can we get your opinion uh, on what we just heard? Um, I mean, you're on the edge of uh, government, uh, although you're not technically part of the government, but um, uh, on Ukraine's discussion with IMF. And by the way, we were successful, by the way, that's a question to Makar, uh, is, what was 7.33, the interest rate that we got for our uh, euro bonds, the, 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 the placement. I have this discussion, constant discussion, is it high or is it low? Uh, so, so we would like to have your opinion. But anyway, the, the, the talk in the town is, as we all know, that you know maybe we don't need IMF any longer, uh, as much as we needed that. As I remember, in 2014, there was nothing left but IMF. So now it's a it's a different reality. How different that reality? And uh, you know, should will other criteria will be? Uh, you know, we have this uh, the, the the word here postponed because we are not th that desperate for money any longer. Well, I mean, just as in BU position, I would like to re-articulate, uh, let's say, the reasons and let's say the benefits of cooperating with IMF. One, and probably the main, is money, <laughs> which is pretty clear. Yeah, I mean, Ukraine already got around eight billion on the current program, and then still has uh, a possibility to utilize another eight billion dollars. Uh, I was pleased to see Ukraine uh, come back to the international markets. It helped to smooth refinancing outlook, but it didn't resolve the problems. It's also pretty clear um, that the refinancing profile, especially for 2019-2020, uh, becoming uh, increasingly challenging, I would say, like that. And therefore, the official financing flows from the IMF, from other donors would help. That's the first argument. Um, the second argument is that, as actually mentioned already, that uh, working with IMF also opens the door for other international organizations. The third is that actually also a signaling role for private investors working with the country because it also affects rating outlook, uh, yields, uh, spreads, which I already said, and so on. Yeah? And the fourth um, argument is that it's more political economy argument that uh, IMF conditionality could help to, to, to pass through important reforms which we have been seeing. I have been really pleased to see pension reform as Yosta has some reservations in terms of what is the final impact of it and the IMF would assess. But in general, I mean, I have been around uh, quite a lot of years. I mean, less than you definitely, but, <laughs> but uh, in, 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 in total, I mean, I would say this for the first time I have seen a drive from Ukrainian authorities to do something with the pension reform. Also, would like to agree with, uh, with, with what Farouk said earlier, yeah, that in terms of land reform also, it looks like a first time there is a, a authorities will and uh, drive to do something with the land reform. I think that's very much encouraging. Therefore, based on this, all these arguments, I would say that uh, it's definitely too, er too early to walk off from IMF uh, for all that reasons. I mean, just to continue to work together because it's a kind of uh, quality stamp, let's say, quality mark. And uh, uh, I have been a part of this roadshow team in the uh, Eurobond issues, and definitely I mean, the issue of IMF has been extremely important for the foreign investors who are considering to buy Ukraine debt. Mitro, you know, as you know, uh, you left your uh, previous employer and I'm trying to fill the gap a little bit as much as I can. So I spent some time in Vienna, in Austria, uh, with uh, our parents uh, in the bank. And obviously, just on this discussion, uh, the IMF uh, uh, cooperation is a major marker for the reforms in Ukraine. Uh, you know, whatever we do or do not do here, uh, if the program goes well, it's Another one story, and if it doesn't, that's obviously very different. Whatever, whatever the indicators, the other indicators are. So, kind of, um, I don't know whether we can extrapolate on the other investors, but I think we can because this is uh, uh, quite a serious uh, investor. Uh, Makar, uh, so the question to you: uh, this uh, private placement, uh, or, I mean, the financial placement. market placement for yeah. the sovereign. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as we say in Ukraine, is it a victory or is it, uh, what's the Zrada <laughs> Yaksabudet? Or is that a failure? Is that a victory or is that a failure? Well, uh, first of all, uh, uh, 
your previous uh, question, whether it's high or low uh, in terms of um, interest rate at which, uh, at which uh, the eurobonds were placed, uh, you know, my answer is it's market. Uh, uh, this is uh, point number one. Point number two, uh, you know, after any placement, you always have these discussions whether, you know, uh, it's a good placement or a bad placement. And the, the answer always depends uh, from whose side you're looking at the issue. Uh, given that uh, the bonds after the placement have traded down and are still trading below par, I think it was a good deal for Ukraine. Uh, because if, uh, you know, the the current yield uh, is, uh, is higher than uh, the yield at which the bonds were placed. Uh, so, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, there is this whole debate, Ukraine is coming back to the capital markets, you know, will not need IMF money, la 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 la. Uh, uh, well, the, the main reason why Ukraine is coming back to the uh, capital markets is because it has IMF. Uh, uh, you know, I fully agree with, uh, with your comments and Dmitry's comments. Uh, there are two elements to the IMF. The, f the first one is, uh, is the reform driver uh, and uh, effectively, you know, the organization that uh, allows uh, the bureaucratic system and uh, the parliament to focus. So which I like very much because otherwise, you know, if people don't get focused, things don't get done. So it's, uh, you know, a true accelerator. At the same time, uh, the position when you don't need IMF is a good position uh, because it's a reflection of a healthy economy or, or a healthier economy. So uh, I think we should be uh, grateful to the IMF for what has, uh, has been done so far and what will be done. But from a practical point of view, I think uh, optionality is always good. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, at this stage with, uh, you know, macro uh, statistics, uh, you know, debt to GDP and growth rates, unfortunately, at least in my opinion, capital markets is not, uh, is not the solution to uh, Ukraine's uh, uh, problems and you cannot build a sustainable uh, economy or sustainable case uh, based on capital markets uh, refinancing because, you know, uh, all the criteria for uh, debt uh, restructuring, external debt restructuring, were not just made up, you know, those are more or less market uh, conditions and, uh, you know, if you massively uh, deviate from those, uh, what happens is that your uh, debt price uh, or debt, uh, debt yields and cost of borrowing goes up. So, uh, just to conclude, uh, uh, just I to conclude, by the way, just to conclude, if I, and, yeah. and, and look forward a little bit. Uh, Absolutely. You mentioned, I, I know you will conclude, but if you can conclude and give your projection for the market, as you mentioned, you know, what's, what's, what are your expectations for the interest rate connecting the dots? Global environment and Ukrainian environment, because that's the question I'm quite sure many people would have, especially to you. Uh, interest rates for the next year, up or down, for Ukraine? Uh, you mean domestic or uh, the borrowing rate? Both. In, in the, uh, both, okay. Uh, to conclude, uh, uh, IMF is important, structural reforms uh, that IMF is insisting are more important uh, and uh, I think uh, once the structural reforms, especially the land and the key reforms kick in, then we will not be in a position to need IMF and I think this is what IMF uh, in reality wants because uh, just as any creditor it wants to be repaid. So, uh, and uh, solely capital markets is not, the, is not uh, the solution at this stage. In terms of uh, uh, Borrowing costs. Uh, I think what is realistically uh, what is realistic to expect in 2018 is a possible uh, uh, change of the credit rating uh, by uh, by a notch uh, on on uh, on the back of. Uh, uh, structural improvements in the external debt profile. And you, and you say up. Huh? The change up. in the rate. Up. Yeah. Up. 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 Yeah. Uh, up. Uh, given that, uh, you know, Ukraine is uh, a 10-year is trading at, uh, at 7% uh, 
and uh, if the uh, the, uh, the curve uh, is not moved massively, I think uh, easily we can expect uh, a 10-year yield to go down to uh, uh, 6.5, you know, closer to 6 uh, in 2018. In terms of domestic interest rates, given the inflation targeting, uh, and, uh, you know, given that uh, headline uh, inflation for 2018, at least uh, based on our expectations, uh, would be around uh, 11, 12 percent, we do not expect uh, a major change in the uh, base rate in, in, in Ukraine and uh, expect it to stay around uh, current levels. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's, get, let's get to your questions uh, and let's get more, more interactive. Please introduce yourselves. By the way, uh, who else has the microphone from the organizers? So you, you can, you know, I can work with this part. Uh, and if somebody can help me there, that would be great. Please introduce yourself and ask uh, specifically who you want to ask the question to, okay? Not, not to the whole panel because it will take too much time, okay? I will keep the, I will keep the mic. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Dmitro. I am a student and I am winner of CFA Research Challenge of 2016. And uh, I have a question to IMEF representative. Um, uh, can you explain how uh, land reform can actually help us if uh, nobody, uh, small size and middle size business, don't pay taxes at all, and uh, how foreign invest in investors will invest money in our country, in our land, if uh, they couldn't be, uh, couldn't know what will be tomorrow. Thank you, Petro. I don't know. You know, when you say nobody pay taxes. <laughs> I pay, you know. <laughs> so don't, you know, be careful. I mean, you're a student. You're just, I mean, we are not. You, we are not on TV, okay? Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a few levels up. Okay. Thank you for your question, Costa. It was a question to you. Can you explain? You know how? What, how? Uh, it's, <clears throat> it's, it's a good question, uh, and I think it it um, it. it basically shows that uh, all of these, all of the reforms are interconnected and uh, I think that's why I said that I thought it was a difficult choice between the, these, these various options and I think land reform has, has a lot of potential. It, it's going to lead to um, foreign investment, foreign investment first in, in, uh, in the purchase of agricultural land, provided that uh, uh, foreigners are allowed to, um, to, to buy Ukrainian agricultural land, and it's going to lead to um, investment in machinery and, and in, in um, uh, infrastructure when there is more certainty about property rights uh, on, on agricultural land. I, the, the two issues that, that, that you brought up, so um, the tax administration and uh, um, tax compliance is something that is, is crucial and uh, tax administration reforms are, are, are important, not just for the agricultural sector but for, for all sectors to ensure a level, level playing field between those who pay taxes and those who, who evade taxes. Um, the other issue on, on uncertainty is, is again, I, I, it's, um, it's one of the key obstacles for both for domestic investment and foreign investment is the uh, lack of trust in uh, the protection of property rights and in, uh, judicial, in the judicial system uh, and uh, concerns about Corruption, so those need to be addressed in, in tandem with uh, the land reform. Okay, uh, Farouk and uh, and Neil, you, you were silent for quite some time. You want you want to add maybe something on this, Neil? Uh, well, um, yeah, just ahead. to add to the issue of uh, uh, land reform, you know, um, Yosta outlined some of the main reasons uh, when. Um, Investors don't have certainty about uh, la their, uh, the use of land rights for an extended period of time. There is underinvestment in agriculture in Ukraine. This is one of the, one of the big uh, uh, reasons. 
Um, and the second is that land, unless you have a market for the sale of ag agricultural land, land cannot be used as a collateral uh, to, get, uh, to, get for, to get credit in the agricultural sector. This is one of the major uh, impediments to attracting investment in the agriculture sector. Um, the, the land rents in Ukraine are one of the lowest um, in Europe. It's about $37 per hectare in Ukraine. Um, compare, compare that to about between $200 and $300 per hectare in, in other countries uh, in Europe. Uh, so, you know, about 4.5 million small Ukrainian landowners are forced to rent out their most valuable asset at peanuts, at a fraction of its value. This is not just unproductive, it is also unjust. Um, so I think this is why land reform, it's not just a, an issue of growth and productivity, it's also an issue of justice for millions of Ukrainian landowners. Neil? I, I don't know that I could say it any better than that. Um, I, but, uh, I was that thinking we need him on the Ukrainian TV, you know. <clears throat> but, then, but, then, but then they would say that, uh, you know, the foreigners will buy all the land, and that's why we have Farouk, you know. <laughs> Canada's had the same problem with Americans coming in and buying up all our land and natural resources. Um, but I think uh, the strength of it is to get uh, a valuable resource effectively used by people who are working it, who are owning it, and uh, it doesn't have to be just small farmers, but it will be a diversity of uh, people involved in agriculture, and you have to play to your strengths. Uh, Ukraine should be a tremendous power in terms of agriculture. Um, well, um, Going back to Dmitry's question, uh, Dmitry, I think uh, I will not elaborate why it's good for the economy to sell the land. In terms of who's going to buy it and why, I think uh, you know it's high risk, high return. In the end of, uh, of the day, we're at the CFA conference, and uh, you know, given my example of 10% cap rate with an equity upside, this is uh, a lot in the current um, uh, environment. So. In terms of return, I think it's there, and uh, uh, interest from potential investors is uh, very high. Uh, in terms of uh, go going back to Farouk, uh, the uh, uh, market rates for the land are much uh, higher than uh, those that you mentioned. It's $150 a year uh, as opposed to 27 So, And this is what should be used as a benchmark to value the land. Um, any other questions? Are you the student as well? I mean, you sit together? Uh, can, it's, I, will, I will get back to you. Uh, yes, you have your hand. Uh, there is a yeah, microphone there. Yes, uh, if I may, I want to ask a question. You have a new president of CFA Society. I want to ask a question to Makar, giving the, he's representative of the market, of the investment industry, and I'm sorry for stealing the question from the second panel. Uh, so we basically now in the situation that Parliament passed the pension reform and t told in a short sentence that from January 2019 we need to have a second pillar basically when people will start to do their individual pension savings. So just you as coming from the market, what is your prognosis? These savings from the day one and the year one, where they will be invested? What, what are the instruments that the private pension savings in this country can be invested in? Well, uh, uh, it's chicken and egg problem, um, uh, as always, in Ukraine. Uh, given the current uh, regulations, which we all assume should, uh, can be and should be changed, so let's be open-minded in terms of uh, governance for the pension funds. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, if those are not uh, amended uh, to uh, reflect uh, the current uh, um, environment, uh, uh, the investable universe is, is very limited and uh, it's, uh, uh, it's still built at this stage. Uh, it can be expected that uh, on the back of uh, additional demand uh, there would be corporate uh, bonds and uh, unfortunately Ukraine never had, uh, will disappoint a lot of people and still doesn't have a functioning equities market. Uh, you know, it's, it's a matter of time when, uh, if, if, if there is demand, yeah, when, uh, you know, they will come and, um, uh, you, you know, we can expect the start of the new equity market uh, here domestically. 
primarily for smaller companies that cannot list uh, internationally. Neil? Um, yeah, I'd like to sort of uh, point that out that the tremendous uh, growth in the Polish equity market uh, a number of years ago based on professional managers of independent pension funds. Uh, Poland had a lot of advantages, uh, integration with Europe, etc. But domestically, it was actually doing more IPOs than London uh, for a couple of years. And uh, it's provided a tremendous base for the Polish economy. The availability of local capital uh, is, a, is a great problem in most emerging markets. Um, and there is no better way to create a basic uh, capital markets than have some available capital. Uh, pension funds will do that. Okay, um, I don't see hands here. Oh, there is a hand. Yes, please go ahead. Vlad Sishinsky, Citibank, Ukraine Treasurer. My question will be to Dmitro. Uh, I have an opportunity to, uh, to ask on this uh, panel. Uh, the central bank monetary policy, and we highly appreciate from the market what, what uh, have been done for the last two years. And, uh, uh, we would like to hear from you what shall we expect next year, how you're going to really address these uh, challenges of getting inflation back to your uh, targets, which is slightly revised for next year, and how to address it, the high interest rate environment with the need for the economic growth. Yeah, thank you for the question. Well, basically, uh, one I think one of the main strategies we have in the central bank is transparency, and we'd like to communicate and articulate what we are doing, why we are doing, and then do actually what we are communicating. Yeah, so do what you say and say what you do, basically. So uh, if we look through latest central bank official communications, it's pretty clear that we have seen um, in inflation increasing, and uh, yes, we have been some idiosyncratic supply factors first, but uh, and to which central banks normally do not react, but what is important is to keep in check uh, fundamental inflationary pressures, expectations, um, and uh, with the science that there is some in the entrenching science of uh, building up fundamental pressure, the central bank recently made a uh, made a um, uh, move to uh, increase the policy rate, at the same time indicating that the um, return path to the uh, target uh, would be a little bit more prolonged than was initially expected, which means uh, that uh, we expect a tightening bias in our monetary policy to, to be there for longer. At the same time, we also clearly articulated other factors we're taking into account, either fiscal projections, yes, we understand coming to the political cycle, there might be pressure coming from that side. Uh, we also indicated the importance of continuation of program with IMF. Therefore, that's all factors we are taking into consideration. And uh, what we will do, well, I mean, there is a key, key instrument, which is a key policy rate, and recently we used it already. Yeah, and I think that's what we uh, still see and we will see in the future as our main policy instrument. And uh, uh, I would definitely say there is no hesitation on the board of the central bank to, to use the instruments if we see that our, our um, um, targets are not uh, fulfilled or we see a kind of a declining probability of targets to be fulfilled in this uh, term. Um, regarding growth, I think it's also important to highlight that inflation targeting is not just about reaching inflation target just to be there on target, that's it. It's about anchoring long-term expectations, but also to be flexible because it's not, about, it's not about inflation per se. It's about macroeconomic stability in more general terms, which means sustainable GDP growth, which means uh, stable situation in foreign exchange market, uh, which means inflation pressure are under control and so on. And that's what we are trying to be flexible there and just to balance between the things. Yeah, I mean, with inflation getting out of control slowly in the, in the kind of, um, in the course of the year, I mean, yes, the central bank had option probably to hike the rates substantially, but then to dampen economic recovery, which just started to evolve. Therefore, here, I mean, we try to be flexible and uh, analyzing carefully the situation on the continuous basis and see what could be done. So you have seen recent the macroeconomic forecast and the inflation report have been published yesterday where it provides more reasoning on that 
we see for next year growth of 3.2% with 7.3% inflation. So to me, this is macroeconomic stability. Yes, it's not yet the level we'd like to see in terms of our inflation targets, but also in terms of growth rates. But I mean, I think we are on the way. And our goal, the goal of our monetary policies is to reach that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let me translate that into normal language in few words. <laughs> the monetary tightening was dropped. Oh no, postponed. Is that, uh, is that, <laughs> that, that's the word we are using. Anyway, uh, more questions. Otherwise, the students will, you know, will take over. Gennady. Thank you. Uh, my name is Gennady. I'm the winner of CFA Research Challenge as well. And uh, I get a question for Neil, I think because uh, it's more practical than uh, more about macroeconomic. Uh, as we know, in all the highly developed countries, uh, there is a high level of uh, interpreters. Uh, maybe there are 30 or 40 of them in all the country, but in, uh, not in the low developed countries like Ukraine or Russia, I think, as well, there's just two to 5% of small and mid-class uh, interpreters. So my question is related to uh, this um, matter, and I'd like to ask you uh, about uh, uh, the programs in our country for the small and mid-class uh, interpreters. Um, maybe some of them are in the project, and uh, how we can use them to develop our country in uh, this uh, sphere. Thank you. I'm just, I'm just curious, Ivan, uh, uh, Ivan Rabinuk. Was it a condition for every student to ask a question, or was the, how, how do you invite it? Anyway, Neil lives in another country, by the way. Yeah, no, he lives in Russia. Yeah. Yes, but he's from Canada. Yeah. And you're asking about Ukraine. It's very interesting to get his opinion. Neil, go, I, go ahead. I, I can try generally by referring to my experience in Canada. Um, actually, the project that I did before I accepted a project, which was supposed to be three years in Russia, uh, was creating a uh, charitable foundation sponsored by two of the biggest banks in Russia and Canada uh, to help young entrepreneurs with uh, starting new businesses. Um, uh, it was based on the model that you may have heard about in, the, in England, the Prince's Youth Business Trust. Uh, Prince Charles has been a great supporter of, of uh, help for uh, disadvantaged kids, kids from uh, at risk, as he says. Um, we changed that in Canada. Uh, we provided loans to uh, somebody on the basis of a good business plan and on the basis of agreement to work with a mentor, an experienced business person, over the term of the loan. There was no security. We figured if, if somebody doesn't want to pay, we've already lost money if we, we tried to go to court. So there's no point in having security over anything. Um, that started up over 20 years ago. Uh, it's still going very strongly in Canada. I think anything that the government can do which uh, supports young people in their entrepreneurial uh, functions is good, uh, but this isn't something government can really do. Um, a little bit, I'm, uh, I say, government can get out of the way, um, but you have to provide the environment and the support, and uh, uh, that support came dramatically from the business community in Canada, not only did the uh, two largest banks each contribute five million dollars of funding. Uh, but we went to the chambers of commerce across the country. Uh, they all volunteered to be the mentors and the, the judges of the credit uh, applications and the, and the business plans. I think there's an opportunity for people uh, to get involved and to, to work with young people in supporting entrepreneurialism. Um, what the framework should be, I, I can't tell you from, uh, from my experience in Canada or in Russia. Uh, it has to be something that develops here. Uh, but uh, it will be an important bit uh, of the diversity of the, Russia, of the Ukrainian economy. Um, but anything you can create, I think, will, will find a supportive uh, help from the rest of the business community. Nobody refuses to, to provide advice to someone who is enthusiastic and young and says, I want to try this. Ask for advice. I guess it's Western and Eastern. Uh, I lived for th three plus years in Southeast Asia, in Malaysia in particular. I mean, it's a very entrepreneurial type of society. And Gennady, jokes aside, that was a great question because that is really the threshold uh, that will uh, move the economy further. Farouk, you want to 
comment on that, maybe? Well, you know, I think there are sort of two uh, big things you can do to um, move economic power away from uh, the concentrated oligarchs to a diverse set of, uh, uh, you know, energetic and entrepreneurial uh, investors. Uh, one is you can create uh, strong anti-monopoly institutions. Uh, Ukraine does have a, a, an anti-monopoly committee, but the, uh, the capacity is weak. Um, it's, uh, the, the, the laws are not so bad, but the capacity to enforce and, uh, and analyze and, uh, uh, and, and hold people uh, to account uh, is, is not there yet. So that's one thing you can do, but that often takes time. Um, the second thing you can do is you can just deregulate. You can make it easier for the smaller people to come in. Um, and, and that's a process that has uh, begun in the last uh, three years. Uh, a lot has been done to deregulate um, uh, 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 in, uh, 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 market rules in, in Ukraine. And we have seen Ukraine's position in the uh, doing business indicators improve uh, from around 130th to, um, uh, to around between 70 and 80. But much more needs to be done in different uh, uh, in, in a number of different and important areas, insolvency, um, construction permits. Uh, there is now a package of legislation in Parliament um, that has been submitted by the Ministry of Economy. Um, and uh, we are hopeful that that will also uh, get passed soon to move uh, the deregulation uh, process forward. But beyond these, um, I I these reforms to sort of, you know, control monopolies, deregulate, there are other uh, market uh, factors that are critical. Um, you know, whenever an economy is moving forward, it moves forward in a number of important wheels. Um, and and in Ukra you know, these are the factor markets, uh, the, the, you know, the, uh, the land markets, financial markets for capital, uh, labor markets. Um, and in Ukraine, a number of the, these factor markets, these wheels, are either flat or they have nails in them. Uh, so the financial sector in Ukraine, 50% is, is owned by the state. This is a problem. This is a place where the state needs to get out. Or, um, uh, I mean, of course, part of the problem was created by the fact that um, the state was forced to take over uh, Privat Bank um, because uh, it, it was basically a, a, a seriously problematic. Um, uh, but uh, a, a financial uh, a banking sector that is 50% owned by the state can never be uh, the most uh, effective uh, um, allocator of credit, cannot, uh, uh, is not an effective instrument for financial intermediation. So many of these other reforms that we've been talking about are also important in order to enable uh, small businesses to thrive. By the way, if we picked up uh, this topic, I see your question. Just, just, just basically fo as, as a follow-up, maybe the panel has uh, an opinion on that. In addition to small business, which I believe I agree with you, I mean, it's the most important driver in the future because people sometimes ask me, you know, what industry we should invest in and what is the, uh, the gold uh, mine in the future. And I always say s service and small business, which, of course, you know, doesn't get me a lot of uh, credit uh, in the industrial community, but as you know, they don't like me anyway. Uh, but at least I'm, I'm being, being honest. Uh, maybe you have a better answer in terms of industrial policy. Uh, you know, what could be the other drivers of the Ukrainian economy in the foreseeable future? Uh, Makar, you have a very concentrated look on your face. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was just thinking about small and medium enterprises and entrepreneurs and uh, what needs to be done. Uh, and and would you, can you share, you know, what's in your, in your mind on that too? M my thoughts are, well, uh, I think uh, reduction of the state uh, size in the economy is going to create a lot of self-employed entrepreneurs. And this is a challenge that uh, has to be uh, sought through and taken care of when uh, we start uh, reducing the uh, share of the economy, uh, well, the share of the state in the economy. Uh, I think uh, there are a number of uh, programs uh, which are sponsored by uh, EBRD and other IFIs to uh, provide capital to entrepreneurs. But, uh, you know, it's not all about uh, support, in my opinion. Because entrepreneurship starts with an idea, with a spirit, with a desire. 
And uh, if there is a way, there, uh, if there is a will, there is a way. And um, you know, we shouldn't be asking the state to, uh, in my opinion, to help with this and that. I fully agree with Farouk about deregulation. You know, the less rules, the better. You know, for the small guy. So uh, uh, you know, this is what I was thinking in terms of. Uh, uh, the golden sectors, your question about the sectors. Other, other, other industries. Other industries that will... Uh, As drivers of the Ukrainian oh, oh. growth. I, realistically speaking, I think uh, Ukraine, if we're talking about, you know, five, ten year horizon, unfortunately, uh, will not be able to change uh, its uh, GDP st uh, structure uh, in terms of industries uh, dramatically despite the fact that we all uh, want to be Silicon Valley or, you know, the uh, banking Switzerland or whatever, you know, wonderful ideas you can read in the press. Manufacturing hub. Uh, yeah, manufacturing hub. Uh, I think uh, 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 for Ukraine, it's all about gaining efficiency in uh, what it is uh, uh, good at at the moment uh, and uh, concentrate on the sectors where it has uh, uh, global competitive advantage. So nothing extremely smart, nothing new. Uh, just stick to your strengths and uh, uh, improvement in those industries will stimulate, uh, will improve the economy and uh, will fund entrepreneurs, will uh, fund, uh, you know, education that uh, hopefully um, uh, will uh, help to transform the economy but over a much longer period of time. I agree. Gosta, can I take the question to you? It's a little bit uh, provocative, I guess, but uh, connects to this entrepreneurship uh, idea, and probably we'll close with that. Is it, is it possible that IMF will set uh, maybe a, not a short term, but a mid term uh, 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 criteria for Ukraine to grow its, uh, the, the, the size of SME from around 15% from what I understand now in GDP to 40, 45% as we have it in the more or less developed uh, countries? The, the discussion here has been about can we identify the sectors that are going to contribute to growth? And uh, my answer to that is probably, probably not. Maybe someone who is uh, Smarter than I am can do that, but uh, my honest answer, I, I don't know what's going to contribute to growth in, in Ukraine. I think the important thing is that uh, the markets decide on, on these sectors and that any market distortions are, <coughs> are removed. And I think for, uh, in, in that context, what, what's important is to uh, reduce the government footprint in the economy and um, privatize uh, the, the over 3,500 state-owned enterprises that are now uh, make up about 10% of, of GDP and employ more than a million people. Uh, I think it's also important to, to ensure that there is access to capital and that banks can, can uh, fulfill their, their role in, in financial intermediation. Uh, and as Farouk was saying, uh, to do this, uh, state banks, uh, the governance in state banks should be improved and they should be privatized. Um, it's also important to um, reduce inf inflation from its current levels of, of uh, around 15, 16% of, percent, uh, to uh, reduce nominal interest rates. Uh, and it's important to continue the work of strengthening banks by ensuring that they have sufficient capital, that supervision is strong, that there are resolution frameworks, uh, so that there is confidence and there is stability in the financial sector. A final point in, in this, I, I, I want to come back to that uh, because I, I think it's so important is to continue the fight against corruption, which is, is really 
uh, a wet blanket over the economy, over investment, and over the development of, of these sectors that I don't know what they are, but, but clearly they, they, they are there. There are sectors with, with good potential, but that uh, corruption needs to be addressed to allow the, these sectors to, to flourish. Okay. By the way, uh, Gosta, can I, can I quote you, uh, can we quote you, uh, and, and, and please correct us if we cannot. In your previous answer, did you say Ukraine were, and I quote, Ukraine where the rampant corruption is? <laughs> Not was, is? Yes, I mean, I mean any, uh, I, I don't know, I, I never like to be quoted because <laughs> <laughs> they, the quotes are never used in a, in, in a way that sort of, Welcome, makes, to, makes you, welcome make, to, new, to, to your new they, position, Ghost. Yeah, they, they never make <laughs> you look good. They, they just uh, try to put you in the, in, on the spot. But I'm, I'm, any uh, assessment of, in any assessment of corruption, uh, Ukraine scores substantially worse than, than, than peer countries in, in Central and Eastern Europe. And also, I think, while countries in Europe, they they address and they improve. Uh, in Ukraine, so far very, very little is, is happening on the, on the corruption front. So, uh, or, or on the, the, uh, the corruption assessment. So I, I just think it's important to continually um, to remind ourselves that uh, this is it is important and it's not just important because, because it's a matter of justice and, and a matter of fairness to people, but it's also an economic issue. Our assessment is that corruption in Ukraine costs Ukraine about 2% of growth each year. So just for that reason, just to improve growth and, and economic welfare, there are good arguments to do something about it. Yes, that, that you can quote. Thank you. Uh, my name is Valentin Khochlov. I'm a CFA charter holder. My question is to Farouk Khan uh, and to other panelists maybe as well. Uh, so you mentioned that land reform is a top priority and also privatization is a second top priority maybe. Uh, but uh, both uh, of uh, those items uh, rely on the price discovery mechanism to work well enough and that requires informationally efficient markets and markets resistant to manipulation. So why don't you think that we should put uh, demonopolization, deregulation and decrease in government uh, footprint first stop priority and only then we can proceed to land reform and to privatization? Thank you. So you're exactly right. Um, hey, land reform in Ukraine, establishing a transparent market from land, for land sales when there hasn't been one for uh, two decades or more, um, requires you know, a history of prices. That's probably right. I, I, I've, I've only been here for about a year and a half, so I'm still learning. Um, but uh, um, you're exactly right. It does require a price discovery mechanism. Um, and, th and that is why we have said uh, um, yeah, uh, all along that um, uh, opening up uh, uh, or an establishing a market for uh, land transactions requires a number of important preparatory steps. Um, and uh, a lot, uh, you know, putting in place in, uh, you know, mechanisms of transparency. Um, there are a lot of errors in the land cadaster. Um, and uh, the government has actually made uh, quite a bit of progress already in fixing many of the errors uh, in the land cadaster. Um, we've also advocated um, a, a registering um, a, all of the rental contracts um, that exist on land, um, uh, registering uh, transactions, um, uh, putting in place a mechanism uh, uh, or uh, an auction mechanism, an electronic, uh, an e-auction mechanism through which uh, land can be uh, sold. So many of these instruments of transparency uh, are critical uh, uh, before you actually open up um, the market uh, for land transactions. Um, the other important uh, preparatory step is to create uh, financial instruments. 
uh, to put in place the legislative and the regulatory framework that would allow uh, banks to use land as collateral to extend loans um, to small and medium enterprises and agricultural investors. Um, and uh, there, there is uh, work being done uh, on that front as well. Um, you know, how you can get uh, from a uh, place where uh, there is uh, no use of uh, agricultural land as collateral uh, to extend credit or very limited use uh, to one where there is um, um, widespread use of agricultural land as collateral uh, to extend credit. Um, I think this is also something that can be beneficial for the financial sector because you have many banks uh, now complaining that uh, there are not um, uh, uh, projects uh, or, or uh, creditworthy projects to which they can extend credit. Um, so this would create a new opportunity for the banking sector um, as well. So you're exactly right, price discovery is important, transparency is important, um, and, and that's why um, a, you know, completing many of those property straps will be um, important for the success of land reform. Okay, we have one more question there. I have a question to Mr. Farooq Khan as well. Yeah, let me introduce myself. I am a CEO of a company which is named Live AG. Uh, we are working in uh, IT and agriculture for four years now, since 2013. So the question will be quite similar to what has just been asked because this problem is really interesting for us as Ukrainians. Uh, everybody was talking about land reform today and that seems to be a key issue for today's forum. And my question will be a continuation of the previous one. So the question is this. Uh, it was said that now people who are 4.5 landowners or potential landowners are renting their land for peanuts. And uh, I am afraid, and I'm not the only one who's afraid of that, that when the land market is open to uh, outside of Ukraine uh, investors and to the Ukrainian investors who are, uh, most of them are oligarchs, as you, as you can say that word. So um, and people won't even get peanuts. They'll just get nothing. They'll sell their land and that's it. It'll be done. The land will go away from them. They'll be uh, just without even those peanuts that they receive right now. So based on that, what kind of security mechanism would you uh, suggest or you could uh, tell us about at least uh, that would prevent this from happening. And another question would be, do, uh, do you think of any a governmental body or a bureau or some kind of um, entity that would uh, keep all of those um, financial uh, numbers and the transparency mechanisms and that would really organize the value of the land? Uh, am I making myself clear right now? So. Uh, do you have in mind any mechanisms for protecting the landowners, first one? And the second one, do you envision any kind of a governmental body or a bureau or entity of that sort that would centralize all the land uh, value numbers and uh, transactions in Ukraine? Thank you. Uh, I don't, uh, I mean, having the government set prices is of course not a good idea, but um, you're exactly right. The concern that um, uh, millions of small landowners would uh, have their land bought up for um, less than peanuts uh, has been the bottleneck uh, to opening up land markets uh, in Ukraine. It has been the big, uh, the big concern that has held up the opening of land markets for the last um, 17 years or uh, others would say 70. Um, um, it's 100, Farouk, uh, in a few, few days. I'm here, I'm sorry, I'm here. Oh, okay. So it's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it, what, in five days, it's 100 years. Oh, five days, it's 100 years, it's more than 70, okay. Um, but uh, look, you, th that is a very valid concern, and that is why many of these preparatory steps to um, uh, create transparency are absolutely critical. Um, uh, to enable price discovery is, is, very, uh, is very important. Um, is, and, and, you know, th there is, tremendous intrinsic value to Ukrainian uh, uh, land, agricultural land. Um, you know, I, I'm, my, my background is not in agriculture. Uh, I'm, I'm a macroeconomist uh, and, inter and an international economist by training. 
Um, I'm learning many of the things about um, the agriculture and the process of engaging in Ukraine. Um, and one of the things I learned is that there's this thing called black soil, um, uh, which is um, uh, one of the most fertile um, kinds of soil uh, on this planet. And Ukraine has one of the world's largest endowments of black soil. So there is no reason why if um, land is sold at a fair value, it should be sold for less than peanuts. But, um, but, but you're right, we need to put in place the mechanisms that uh, ensure that land is sold uh, at a fair value. And that is why these, uh, instru uh, these uh, mechanisms of, uh, of transparency, uh, registering, um, uh, land uh, rent, rental uh, contracts, so people uh, have a, uh, an understanding of what the rental value of land is, which would then in, a, in, in turn enable them to understand what the price of, of land is. The other important instrument, uh, mechanism as I mentioned, is to um, create financial instruments so that uh, people can not only um, sell their land, but they can use their land as collateral. Um, that is another way uh, for, uh, to enable people to realize the value of their most uh, important asset. Uh, so very important concern, but also a concern that can be managed in, a, in, a, in, a, in order to unleash the potential of this uh, tremendous uh, asset that this country has. Uh, Mahat, and then Neil. Sorry. Uh, well, it's very interesting to hear, you know, from an American about uh, uh, protecting and not selling oligarchs buying. I think, uh, you know, the land reform, uh, at least in my opinion, you know, no drafts exist, but uh, the land reform covers two <coughs> areas of the agricultural land. One is state-owned, as I said, it's 12 million hectares. The second one is uh, all this land owned by uh, private individuals. And uh, I think uh, when you say the land would be um, bought from them from peanuts, uh, la, 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 uh, the question is, you know, right now they have an asset that they own the asset that they cannot sell. If you look at the demographics of the landowners, you will see that uh, uh, the majority of the landowners are older than 65 years old. And uh, I would disagree that uh, if you look at market rates, uh, I would disagree that $150 in terms of uh, rental income per year is peanuts. And uh, yes, land, land is a different asset class, but uh, you know, there are a lot of wonderful books sponsored uh, you know, by the CFA Institute and uh, done by um, very respected um, professors. Uh, the modern is my favorite. You know, if you have a rental income of 150, uh, then uh, you know, with uh, certain deviations that you can insert into, into your assumptions, you will get to uh, a market or implied uh, value <clears throat> of, the, of the land. And that once you know, there is a price in the market and the price will appear only when you can sell something, then it's up to a private individual to decide whether he or she wants to sell or whether she or, or he wants to keep it for the uh, uh, rental yield. And, uh, you know, it's optionality, and optionality is very good. It's, 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 it's much better than having no option. So, uh, you know, nobody can force people to sell, in my opinion. And, uh, you know, uh, despite Ukraine being perceived as a wild country, you know, some fundamental things, uh, you know, do hold and uh, uh, private property rights, um, are one of the fundamental issues that I think, in my opinion, Ukraine owners. Okay, Neil? Uh, just to, to add to that, I think you underestimate the intelligence of people who uh, own something. Uh, when houses were, or apartments were privatized in, the, uh, in Russia, there was a tremendous fear that, well, people would buy up apartments uh, and people would be left without homes. Most people kept their apartments. Yes, some of that happened, uh, and some people have made mistakes at selling apartments much too early in the, in the cycle. Um, but I think uh, proper in, 
uh, information supporting the uh, idea will make people realize their, their asset is valuable. Uh, people over 65 tend to be conservative. Farmers tend to be conservative. They're not going to just throw this away. Um, but it will provide an ability to provide the flexibility to the young people uh, because people who are 65 probably have children that they'd like to help in business. And um, when you ask for the uh, uh, where the growth will come from, I think one of the things I've seen in a post-Soviet economy is the uh, disregard of tourism. Um, when I was a student, I, I had a summer job being a waiter in a hotel. And my Russian colleague looked at me and said, well, that must have been terrible. You know, you spent all summer helping people and having to smile at them all the time. And I said, yeah, it was great fun. It was, great. Uh, it was outside the city, etc." So I asked him what he did. He said, well, we dug potatoes. That was much better. To me, well, life is choices. Uh, but working in a nice hotel uh, or in a restaurant or starting up a restaurant or a coffee shop, uh, there's tremendous unappreciated potential in that area. And uh, it doesn't need a lot of capital, it needs a lot of energy. I think that is one of the areas, you know, along with agriculture and, and technology, et cetera, et cetera. But there's really underappreciation of, of uh, tourism and the service industry. And other service industries too. Uh, <clears throat> that would be a great uh, closing statement, uh, unless somebody wants to give in even a better closing statement, because I have to bring this train at 11 a.m. to the, you know, uh, to, this, to the next stop. <laughs> Uh, Costa, Dmitro, you, you were silent for the last couple of minutes, uh, so shall we, shall we finish with that? Great, so basically let me, let me sum it up. We will vote, Alexander, we will vote as you have suggested uh, after we finish, because you know why? Because these guys do not have devices. And uh, if those guys, do, if we do not vote, you know, then land reform goes tremendously down and uh, that's not the result we would like to see. <laughs> you have your... What happened? Okay. Uh, look, uh, I think it was, uh, I, I, we, we tried hard, as you, as, as you see, uh, so we, we had to give the top-down macro outlook from global to Ukrainian trends. I guess that's what we did, starting from Jerome Powell down to tourism and potatoes. And I would like to thank our terrific panel, uh, starting from Makar this time, Makar Pasenyuk, <laughs> uh, Neil <laughs> Parukhan, uh, Gosta, and Dmitro, thank you very much. <laughs> Alexander, come back with your, with your votes so that we can vote. Thank you, let's get back and vote and, uh, and then proceed for the, for the coffee and tea. Thank you.